Now, please welcome Politico's Chief Operating Officer, Officer Kim Kingsley. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming in from the rain. Uh, on behalf of Politico's publisher, Robert Albritton, our CEO, Fred Ryan, and our partners at Google and the Tory Burch Foundation, I am pleased to welcome you to our third event in the Women Rule series. This is an amazing moment in our lifetime. Women are indeed beginning to rule. Last month, we launched the series spotlighting amazing women who have innovated a movement. If you haven't already looked at our phenomenal essays on Politico, I'd urge you to go and read about Greta Van Susteren's friendship with Roberta McCain and Ruth Bader Ginsburg's take on Sandra Day O'Connor. Next week, we'll bring you award-winning author Terry McMillan's words on Michelle Obama. Today, we are very excited to continue exploring the many ways women are impacting change by showing how women are economically empowering themselves and empowering other women as well. We also want to share the realities of where women are on the playing field, but offer solutions, not complaints. We are fortunate to have panelists with us today who are renowned doers. They have dedicated their careers to finding solutions for women and have generously shared their successes with other women, too. And this is an incredible audience here today. Among you, we have a member of Congress, the first female White House press secretary, the founders of a cupcake dynasty, yum, uh, diversity leaders, digital entrepreneurs, corporate executives, and more. Politico, Google, and the Tory Burch Foundation were built by entrepreneurs. And it's our hope that you will leave today's event feeling empowered to think big, become an entrepreneur, support an entrepreneur, or at the ver very least, value the entrepreneurial spirit. We also want to draw attention to the importance of women helping women, a real hallmark of our panelists here today. We hope everyone has an opportunity to ask questions and share experiences through our roundtable discussions in a bit. And if the spirit moves you, take a moment during today's discussions to write your name and a question you'd like to ask our panelists on the cards we gave you earlier. We'll have our Women Rule team circulate throughout the event to collect your questions. You can also ask questions via Twitter at hashtag Women Rule. And I'd like to, again, thank Google and the Tory Burch Foundation for their energy and support on this series. We're so delighted to be working with them. And now, without further delay, I'd like to welcome Politico's Mike Allen and our panel to the stage. Thank, thank you, KK. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kim Kingsley, who does uh, such a great job of running and growing our company and always has solutions and not complaints. Uh, I'm Mike Allen, your designated dude today. Um, and i uh, quite honored uh, to have a great uh, panel uh, with us, which is going to come out right now. Um, uh, we have uh, Dina Powell, who's, who's with us, and Natalia Oberti Noguera and Julie Katzman and Karen Mills right here. Go ahead and have a seat. Um, so, um, uh, those of you who are out in live stream land, we wanted to welcome you and we'll be taking your questions, as Kim mentioned, at hashtag women rule. I have a Twitter machine here, which will uh, give me your questions and uh, I'll get the chance to um, uh, answer them. A very appreciative to Google, uh, which has a great Washington office run by Susan Molinari, who I still call Congressman, Congresswoman out of um, habit, and the Tory Burch <laughs> Foundation. Uh, we're very grateful to them for making uh, women rule um, possible. It's one of the most important things Politico is doing this year, so very excited uh, to be here. Real quick to tell you about our amazing uh, panelist, Julie Katzman, who's a New Yorker, who's become a Washingtonian, is executive vice president and COO of the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank. Natalia Oberti Noguera, who awesome. gave me a little uh, coaching uh, earlier and says I'm doing. Uh, Ask the okay, colors. Okay, thank you. Is the founder and CEO of the Pipeline Fellowship. And Natalia knows, you guys know that uh, Puerto Rico Playbook is big on birthdays. <laughs> well, today is a special day that Natalia pointed out to me. It's the International Day of Girl. Mm -hmm. And who run the world? <laughs> Girls. Good. Girls. So as, as she was saying backstage, uh, not just uh, women rule, but uh, girls rule um, as well. Uh, Dina Habib Powell from the Goldman Sachs Foundation. She's the global head of engagement 
for Goldman Sachs. A lot of you still know her as Madam Secretary from when she is in the uh, State Department of the Bush administration. And she runs Goldman's fantastic programs, uh, 10,000 Women, which is a five-year initiative to offer uh, business and management education to women entrepreneurs around the world and 10,000 small businesses. How, how many women is 10,000 women up to now? Uh, well, uh, I'm so proud you asked because this month we actually have reached our 10,000th woman. So we're so, okay, extremely so it's, proud. So it's now the 10,001 <laughs> Women Program. And Karen Mills, who I still call Administrator Mills, uh, escaped August 31st <laughs> from the President's Cabinet. Uh, she was the administrator of the Small Business Administration. Uh, she was a venture capitalist before that and uh, now is up at uh, Harvard. Uh, currently, she's at the Institute of, of um, uh, IOP, Institute, Institute of, of Politics, Politics, right? I was trying to add Politics something else to that. Is that I knew it was the IOP, for. the Institute of Politics, and then after that, she'll be with the uh, Harvard Business School. Beth Furking, fun to see you down here in the uh, front row. So we're gonna start off with a jump ball question that anybody can answer. If more women were in leadership in Washington, would the government be shut down? <laughs> Uh, Karen, go. Well, I have to say that I'm here today for lots of reasons, but one is I love the title Women Rule because um, women in power really does lead to, we think, more effective outcomes. And it is not just because we think that women uh, can get together and find common ground and collaborate. I think it's also because women in power tend to look and ask the following question. What is the outcome we're trying to achieve? And when you know the outcome you're trying to achieve, then you can be tough, you can, you, you know, you can say no, you can lead, but you know that there's an objective out there that you want to get to and that that is what mo moves the world forward and sometimes prevents uh, log jams. And so, what we're seeing is so that... Excuse me just a second. So I'm just going to translate the answer to that is no. The government would not be shut down, right? <laughs> uh, Natalia? Well, I was going to say, the, the, it's a moot point. And what we are seeing, actually, is that it's the women in Congress who are leading the end of the shutdown with U.S. Senator Collins and other women who are coming Senator together. Senator Patty Murray is going to be do the, doing the budget negotiating? Right. And, and that's what we're seeing, that when there are women, and if there were more women, even if that they're actually uh, being part of the solution, which is what's important. And uh, Dina Powell, what have you told uh, young women that you've uh, mentored and advised who are going into leadership positions in Washington? What do you tell them about navigating this crazy city? Mm. I see one young woman I had the privilege of uh, working with, and that's Genevieve Ryan, who worked with us uh, in the Goldman Sachs Foundation this summer on 10,000 Women. Um, and uh, Genevieve is uh, interested in thinking about a career in Washington and maybe nonprofit service. And actually, what I tell her and so many uh, women and men is that we live in a world now where you are rarely going to be in a position um, for 30 years or 20 years, you know, the way a previous generation of somebody might have worked at GE or Ford for a whole lifetime. You know, now you're really going to have different phases of your career. And the one thing uh, that really stands out, even in this partnership, uh, is that bringing the public and private and media together um, is, is always going to be critical. So having a chance to work in government for a period of time, to work in the private sector, to work in the public sector, gives you, I think, kind of a really well-rounded experience base for any role that you're going to have. Um, I spent 15 years in government and really was such an honor and a privilege. And now that I'm at Goldman Sachs, I have the chance to see kind of the flip side of how you execute with uh, a little more efficiency. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> um, you know, because... Well, she agrees, don't worry. <laughs> the, the, you You've heard my bosses talk about, you know, measurement, results, budget. Uh, you know, there's no shutdown at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> we, we have to, you know, really um, do the st same strategic planning as the busy units do. And I think that's what's differentiated 10,000 women and, and it's made us proud is that we have actually tracked every single woman around the world that we work with and every small business owner and really tried to prove the case, make the data set very clear that when women are economically empowered, not only does GDP grow and economies flourish, but all of society changes.
Uh, now, Dean, I've been uh, honored to go to a couple of the graduations for 10,000 women and 10,000 small businesses. And the great thing about these programs is you teach them metrics. We, you're right. We do. We actually start by saying, um, if you don't measure it, you don't know it exists. And that is in every bit of your business. Um, a lot of the women that we work with um, actually come in with, you know, a, a shoebox of receipts and uh, that's their financial planning model and they you know obviously one of the great things we hope Sounds they like get out expenses. of it <laughs> take it yes that that would be right we can help you out michael <laughs> um but actually you know and then they don't understand why it's difficult to get a loan well you actually have to have a financial plan and a business plan and if you're um you know holding yourself accountable for the growth um and that business plan it makes a big difference and by the way somebody's wearing tory here um, <laughs> so uh women rule has talked a little bit about a lot about political empowerment. Julie Katzman, one of your specialties is economic empowerment for women. Mm -hmm. And you talked to me about starting at the bottom of the pyramid. I was interested in that. Right. So um, we are we are a development bank. That's the D and IDV. And um, we do a lot of work across the institution about women's economic empowerment. And largely, the women who we're targeting are people who are amongst I wouldn't say the poorest, but the, what we call the bottom of the pyramid, which is sort of the bottom billion. And, and that means focusing... That's sobering to say it that yeah, way. Yeah, right. Um, and that means focusing on micro-businesses and small businesses more than medium-sized enterprises, but also a little bit of medium. And I was, I was saying earlier, and, and Dina was talking about metrics, <coughs> one of the things that we find is there's a lack of information. <coughs> Right, so, so we play a role also in doing projects on the one hand to create information, but also <coughs> looking at where are the information gaps, how do we fill them. So we, we launched a flagship product this year called the Women's Economic Empowerment Venture Scope with the Economist Intelligence Unit. And it looks at a broad base of countries in Latin America and says, what is the, the environment and whose environment is better? You know, rankings, so you guys know, um, have a lot of cachet and they motivate behavior, we have found. Mm -hmm. uh, no one really wants to be last. So if you say, okay, we're gonna look at women's economic empowerment in 20 countries on five dimensions and we're going to do this ranking and we're going to see what helps, what hurts, and how good you all, all are at doing this. And that's one of the things that we've done this year. We're looking at what makes those women who actually are succeeding and growing rapidly, what distinguishes them from women's businesses that don't? Things of that sort, so that we can then build on that information, whether it's with 10,000 women or other projects that we're doing. So, uh, Karen Mills, to go from the bottom billion to the top 0.01%, uh, you know a lot and have great relationships with business leaders. What would you like to see business leaders doing during this time when Washington is in uh, uh, so much uh, chaos? Well, we know that the American economy relies on its entrepreneurs in order to grow. And right now, we're spending a lot of time talking about the deficit and tax, but we know actually to grow this economy, we need to create jobs. And who creates the jobs? Turns out in this country that entrepreneurs create the jobs. Um, two thirds of the job creation is done by small business. Main Street small business in this country is very important but the most of the net new jobs are created by a very small number of high growth businesses. And it turns out that the fastest growing startups in this country are women owned businesses mm -hmm. and Hispanic owned businesses. They're just accelerating, but they can't get access to capital. Mm -hmm. They don't have the mentors and the networks. And at the Small Business Administration and in other public-private partnerships, um, we have really focused, and I focused for the last five years, on addressing those gaps in the market. So people are talking a lot now about what should government's role be, what should business's role be. Turns out, public-private partnerships, like Goldman Sachs has started, are really essential pieces of getting our economy growing again. And it's not yes and no, it is together. And this, uh, this set of formulas we call creating entrepreneurial ecosystems. Mm -hmm. They are particularly important for groups that don't have access and opportunity, but still have that entrepreneurial spirit. So we can create jobs, not just in Silicon Valley, but all across this country and led by all of our talented entrepreneurs, including 
are women entrepreneurs. Now, Natalia, one of the programs that the Pipeline Fellowship has is an angel investing boot camp for women. They come for six months and actually bring money with them and collectively invest. You were telling me that after working with those women, you realize that sometimes people have a preconception about what a woman CEO like Kim Kingsley or CEO is going to be like. Talk about those preconceptions. Well, what is the face of, some, of a microfinance-backed entrepreneur? And what is the face of a VC-slash-angel-backed entrepreneur? Let me spell it out. Woman of color, white guy. <laughs> and uh, that's really, as a queer Latina, I'm very passionate in making sure that we get more women of color and women and people of color on the investing side because we have heard so much about how pattern recognition really is the way that people get funded. There was a very prominent Excuse tech... Me, pattern recognition, tell me what that is. I'm just about to Sorry. say it. Um, <laughs> there, there's a very prominent tech investor a few years ago who, talked, who was asked, well, what do you look for when you invest? And he was like, someone like me. Mm -hmm. And he most recently... Um, became uh, came into the news because he also acknowledged that he usually doesn't consider investing with people with accents and so he yeah. came under a lot of flack for that and that's exactly what pattern recognition is investing in what's familiar and what uh, we understand and so often that means that for white guys who tend to be predominantly the ones with the uh, purse strings in the VC world and also in the angel investing world, they tend to invest in other white guys. Just to give you some stats, in, um, in 2012, out of all the US angel investors, only 22% were women and only 5% were minorities. And I'll, 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 I'll start up with like the optimistic uh, tone, turn of events and then we can go back to the dreary event as well. Uh, in 20 11 out of all the U.S. angel investors, only 12% were women and only 4% were minorities. So, and, and this is where I, I, to provide some context, the Pipeline Fellowship, this angel investing bootcamp for women, we launched April 2011, so please keep that in mind. So in one year, we're talking about 12% going up to 22% in terms of women. Minority U.S. angels investors, they, it still went up. It went from 4 to 5%. We still have a long way to go. And when I was talking about preconceptions, I very simply came about launching the Pipeline Fellowship because I'm a huge advocate for for-profit social ventures. And I'll be cheeky right now because there's a lot of conversation regarding public-private partnerships. And uh, I grew up, actually, uh, my father used to work for the UN. So growing up, I got to see a lot of these public-private partnerships firsthand. And, um, I will say that one of the reasons that I love for-profit social ventures is exactly because it's almost a PPP unto itself. It has the efficiencies of the corporate world and it has the heart of the nonprofit world. And what I realized was that in a, once again, entrepreneurs were ahead of the curve. They were coming up with these hybrid business models. And my take was we need to create more hybrid investors who get the value of the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profits. Mm. Now, Dina, I think you were going to jump in and add a point about pattern recognition. And also, yeah, I was. And, and uh, a big part of it is the how important mentoring is and how important having a role model for whether you're a businesswoman or a woman in leadership, um, it, it actually is always cited as the differentiating factor that gave someone the confidence to move forward. And I'll just kind of talk about the a domestic example and international example. Um, the Tory Burch Foundation. I mean, uh, Tory, when she started her business, um, says now that the reason she wanted to start her incredible enterprise was to so that she could build a foundation to support other female wow. entrepreneurs. And she, um, I, you know, may, might even say this later, but you know, and how many uh, investors would say to her, her, oh, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't even say that. And she now says it with such pride and it's made such, such an impact. Um, we have a partnership with the Tory Birch Foundation through 10,000 Small Businesses, which works with female entrepreneurs that have already gotten seed funding from Tory's work um, and going through her foundation. And they, uh, we now have a special curriculum for them. These are women who maybe have one year of a business. They're just beyond a startup and they just don't have the confidence. Um, they have the talent, they have the product, and they 
they just can't believe that there are other women like them. I mean, obviously they look up to Tori as a hero for them, that just nine years ago she built this global enterprise, um, which is extraordinary. And then they also have the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring in the program. They see other women like them who are facing the same challenges, and they think, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. And what's really amazing about our partnership with um, the Tori Birch Foundation is that not only are we seeing exciting numbers in terms of revenue growth and job creation, but 75% of them are now doing business together. Not just referring business, but actually have created a marketplace together. And that's what happens when women really come together. And then I see um, Assistant Secretary of State Evan Ryan there and I'm so thrilled that already one of her focuses is um, the promotion of female entrepreneurship around the world. In many ways, there's nothing more valuable that the United States could promote than women in business and women as agents of change. Is it true that Evan Ryan is in your literal office? <laughs> they've, uh, the up, they've upgraded the job when they put Evan into it. But yes, I had the privilege of serving there. And, with, um, and we were just today actually talking about many partnerships, including one, Elisa, um, uh, Nelson uh, runs, which is the Vital, uh, Vital Voices program, uh, the Fortune Mentoring program, which will be here next week. But th this notion of mentoring is not just kind of a nice support network or you know being friendly with each other. It is actually uh, attributing to the bottom line in terms of creating new markets. Julie Katzman. So, so I have two two. has seeded about 15 venture funds in Brazil. Most of them have become quite successful. So when I first took my job, I went to Brazil and I went to meet all these, these venture management companies. And by the fifth, sixth one, every time I got invested to the team, it was 100% male. So by you know, the seventh one, I said, OK, are there any women? <laughs> and he said, oh, of course. So the next thing I know, the person who's the secretary in the accounting department is being brought into the room. So, okay, look, you know, you guys, we give you our money. We've got a lot of agendas. Big part of it is a social agenda. Go hire some women. I promise you that out of the business schools, they're really capable women and they want these jobs. So 12 months later, the guy who's the managing partner came to Washington and he said, okay, we hired two women. You were right. They're really good and they work so much harder than the men. <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, this is not a surprise. Hopefully for more. The for the, the same pay, absolutely the same pay. And the second one is just about mentoring. You know, we, we recently finished, and, and a part of this was with 10,000 women, a project in Peru where we, we trained uh, 100,000 female micro entrepreneurs with sort of a small quantum of training, including some reinforcement from telenovelas that were on TV. And at the end of the day, what you find out is you feel, and we did this for this reason, we did a very big impact evaluation, control groups, what works. You feel great about all this training, but it's not really having much of an impact. The piece that has impact is the mentorship. And what we have to do now is put more money into mentorship and follow these women for a longer period of time to be able to show that yes, it costs more, but the rate of return is really there. Oh. Mike, can I ask a question of this group? How many of you are entrepreneurs, have a business, want to wow. have a business? How many of you have a mentor, advisor, counselor? Anyone? Well, I'll tell you, this is more hands than usually go up, because usually the guys that are like, no, I don't really admit that I have a mentor. But we have data that shows that if you have a mentor, an advisor that you meet with regularly, you have better sales, better profits, uh, more longevity, and you hire more people. Yeah. And in, there's a network out there, um, all kinds of networks out there, and the SBA has a network of about 12,000 score and small business development centers that are free. So that is a really essential part, one of the sort of three essential parts for entrepreneurship, counseling you know, and a mentor, capital, and then sales, business opportunity. So uh, reporters always have an ear for a great quote and behind uh, the uh, curtain uh, backstage, uh, Julie Katzman told me a great quote. And by the way, this is a good tweet if you're tweeting out there, <laughs> hashtag women rule, Julie Katzman, uh, told me what women are not. Tell me uh, that. That women are not a niche. <laughs> so it's a pretty good tweet, huh? That's a good one. And, and the context good. is, you know, we do work with financial institutions, and they say, well, you know, 
It's a niche market for us. It's 50% of the population. <laughs> so there's an organization called the Global Alliance on Banking for Women. I may have just gotten the Global Banking Alliance for Women. Sorry, GBA. Um, and, and it's a, a global network of banks who are committed to growing their presence in the market for women in both terms of in terms of both enterprises and individuals. And it's people who say, hey, you know, this isn't a niche. We may need to serve that market differently to have the most impact, but it's certainly not a niche market. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's a really important thing that we're trying to uh, get financial institutions to understand. Okay. We're gonna go now to my colleague Lois Romano, who's helped make women rule possible, and I think she might have a question. Um, thank you, Mike, and thank you, ladies. Um, and Mike, thank you for being our token dude. It's an honor. Um, you all are talking about mentorship in one form or another, and but you all are part of um, enterprises, institutions you've either created or joined. Um, when I was a young reporter, um, there weren't that many women that wanted to help other women. We used to call it the queen bee syndrome. So what I'd like to know is how can you encourage women to help other women if they're not part of a large organization? Uh, that's a great question, Lois. Um, you know, I think actually it's, it's forums like this, first of all. You know, I think women um, are very inclined to help other women, but they don't have the access. They don't know how to find whether it's women entrepreneurs or young women to mentor. So obviously the Tory Burch Foundation and this partnership with Google and Politico is a start. Um, we've done a number of minute mentoring activities uh, with Tory. Um, but also, you know, one of the things that um, I learned from Susan Molinari actually many years ago when she was a female congressman on the Hill and I was working there, um, is that it's, it's really important that you think of yourself as a mentor early. You know, not that you're being mentored, but that you look back and say, gosh, you know, even though I'm at this early stage in my career, I really could have an opportunity to make a difference if I reach out to someone. And so I, I think so, so many of us don't even realize that we, we have that opportunity. The, well, the other part that I would say is I, I'm a huge believer that mentoring is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. So knock us, knock us on Twitter, you can also quote that. Uh, so I call it co-mentoring. You know, so I call that co-mentoring. And just a, f a few things. There, there was a study done in terms of how women, of course it's a gendered study, uh, on how women mentor and how they network versus how men network. And the, what the study came up with was that men have this huge network and they go to it for their professional, for professional support and for personal support. And what turned out, according to the study, is that women have two networks, one for their professional support and one for their personal support. So they were missing out on a lot of opportunities because they weren't cross-pollinating. They weren't asking for personal support to their professional network and they weren't asking regarding professional support from their personal network. Case in point, you know, the, the, the storied, um, you know, anecdote on two guys meeting, you know, playing basketball, and then they actually end up with, you know, brokering a business deal versus, and this is a true story, um, an acquaintance sharing with me that it wasn't until the fourth month of doing downward dog next to this woman that she realized that she was actually a potential investor. So I, I, you know, I bring that up in terms of also being out of the box in terms of where you could find your potential investors or potential, uh, professional opportunities that could be in that book club that you frequent. The other part that I would say, and it's provocative from the other side of the table, and Whitney Johnson, she's Johnson Whitney on, on Twitter, she wrote, a, she has an HBR blog, and she wrote in a post on how whenever she would meet a guy at an event, he would say, you should really meet Sally. And um, then, you know, she would meet Sally, and they're like, hmm, I wonder why. <laughs> we were connected and it was like, oh, it's because we're both women. So the other side of it is also, if we can in integrate you know, the men that we know and push, challenge them to say, well, who do you know who would be a strategic person, whether it's a woman or a guy in your network who could help further my career, further my business, that would also help in terms of us increasing the influence that our network can have. Okay, Natalia had some good practical ideas there, and we're gonna stick in this practical realm for a minute. If I'm a young woman, uh, say Genevieve Ryan, and I am going to the workforce, I'm starting a business, want to start a business, Karen Mills, what are some of the very like practical 
day-to-day, person-to-person advice that you would give that young woman? Right. The first uh, piece of advice, and um, we touched on this earlier, is have a plan. Having a vision, having an idea is all fine, but you actually have to have a plan, which you turn into business a business plan. So you have to think through what is it that you're trying to achieve. And it could be that you very much want to have a home business, you want to have a part-time business, you want to turn a hobby into a business. It could be that you have um, a vision of building something quite large. Depending on your plan, then you reverse engineer success. You say, if I want to be $10 million in three years, what do I have to do to get there? How much money do I have to have to develop this product? How many people do I have to have? And that will bring you to understand whether you <coughs> should seek out angel financing, whether you should seek out venture financing, whether you could self-finance it you know, with your $2,000 of savings. And those courses are very different. So the first thing to do is to have a plan. And once again, I'll repeat, if you, don't, if you have trouble getting that plan, there's a whole network of people out there, um, score counselors and advisors and mentors, who will help you um, write that plan. And there's a template on the SBA website. Um, and I think, is why this, try to reinvent the talk wheel? Talk a little bit about that. Is that the Give Me Five? Uh, is that part of the Give so Me Five So Give program? Me Five is, is another program. Um, many people, especially in the Washington area, make their living most days, not today, uh, working <laughs> with the government. Uh, one of the great sad things about the government shutdown is that um, the hundreds of thousands of small businesses that serve the government are also shut down. Mm -hmm. And that whole supply chain is really going to have a terrible negative impact. But one thing we have in this country that actually is the envy of many other countries is that we have a, a rule that says 5%, um, give me five, um, of all of this my, um, contracting is going to go to women. And each point of contracting is about $5 billion a year. So we're talking about mobilizing $25 billion of contracts into the hands of women. We're at 4%, we need to be at 5%. But once again, that's not one point, that's $5 billion. So how do we get more women into this contracting flow? If you are a woman in this area, you have a skill or expertise, you want to go, once again, on the SBA website, you want to become a GSA uh, contractor, and you want to self-register in the SBA program for women-owned uh, businesses, uh, as a woman-owned business, and that can give you preference and set-asides on contracts. And that gives you sales and revenue, which is the oxygen you need. Okay, to stay very practical for a second, Natalia, at the Pipeline Fellowship, one of the skills that you teach is pitching. What are your top tips on pitching? Yes, so let's start with pet peeves. I judge a lot of pitch events, and one of the ones that I see is, no one has thought of this. I'm first. I'm the first one, to, uh, first to market. And I actually find much more compelling pitches that say, this is the market landscape. These are eight potential competitors, and this is how my product or service differentiates itself. So being very specific, it shows that you have done your research. It shows that you have a plan. It shows that you are you understand how you're adding value to the market and how you're meeting a pain point. The other one I'd say, interestingly enough, is that pitching is, I'll, I'll say what I think and then I'll share a, a quotation. Pitching is storytelling and it's knowing that narrative and, and knowing how to be compelling about it. Uh, Dana Goldstein, she is one of our the first entrepreneur who secured funding from our angel, angel, angels in training. Once they graduate, they become angel investors. And what she likes to say is that pitching is simply the start of a conversation. So if you can think about it that way, it, it, it really normalizes it and makes it a much more comfortable uh, event. Here are some stats for you. So we know from the blogosphere that women and people of color entrepreneurs are not getting funded guess what? Women and people of color entrepreneurs are not pitching either. And so just to give you some stats from 2012, out of all the uh, startups that were pitching to U.S. angel investors, only 16% of them were women-led. And from that 16%, 25% secured funding. Out of all the uh, startups that were 
pitching to US Angels in 2012, um, only 6% were minority led. And from that 6%, 18% secured funding. So of course, there are reasons such as uh, people not realizing that they have a scalable business that could be able to secure funding, because that's the other thing. If you don't have a scalable business, then angel investing, VC type of uh, capital is not, is not for you. The other part of it is that uh, they, they might not be invited into the room. That's the other part. The third part, which I'm much more keenly interested in because it's about us, is we just might not be pitching because we don't think we're ready. And so that's why this is, once again, quotable, Nakis Nakis, women rule. Um, I'm, I'm on, like, as a queer Latina, I have several agendas, and this one is uh, pitching isn't a zero-sum game. So I'll repeat it again. Pitching isn't a zero-sum game. And the reason I'm saying that is because I meet a lot of entrepreneurs who are like, I don't know, I'm not ready. I don't think I'll win if I pitch today. And my whole take is that even if you don't secure the funding from pitching that day, by sharing your idea, by sharing your company, there, those potential investors might know someone who might be interested in, in your company and might be interested in investing. And also, they might provide key critical feedback to get your business to a place that can better fulfill market needs. I think Lois Romano has another audience question for us. Actually, I was going to turn to the audience. Okay. Um, does anybody here, would they like to ask a question of this fabulous group of women? And oh, while, come on. While somebody's looking and just grab the microphone, I'm going to ask Julie Katzman, you're on a couple boards, including the International Center for Research on Women and the MacArthur Foundation Awards the Genius Grant. What do you, what advice do you give women to push beyond some of the constraints that they might have, either if women are uh, risk averse or because they're too cautious? How do they overcome those? So, you know, we have a really interesting conversation going on inside our own organization about that question. Because people say women are risk averse, but we're not really convinced. Um, you know, it is true that in our part of the world and in many parts of the world, women end up having to borrow more to start their businesses because they don't have the same level of savings. Okay, so then that's a rational thing. If I'm levered at the very start of my business, I should make sure that I can pay my debts, right? And then maybe when I've paid that down, it has affected the way I think about how to grow my business because I just got out of debt, now do I want to go back into debt? But am I naturally more risk averse? Really not clear. Um, so I just, I want to say that because I think that women are maybe getting a bad rap on this whole risk thing. Um, but, you know, overall, um, I think if you put it in the, in the introduction, you talked about a couple of boards, um, you know, there's been a big conversation about why is it that there are still sort of 20% of women or less who are on large company boards throughout the world other than in those places that have put in place legislation requiring more women on boards. Um, and again, I don't think that has a thing to do with not leaning in um, or with risk aversion. It has to do with what do people who run those companies see as normal. And they got 20% of women on their boards, and they think that's just fine. I'm about to get the hook from Beth here. So for the Grand Slam cleanup question, uh, either from Lois or someone with a microphone. Someone back here had a question. So oh, Laura. Hi, I have a question. Uh, you get the you last know. word. Hi, uh, Laura McGann. My question is, um, I feel like uh, being in this room, there's sort of a lot of themes that I've seen coming together about women and entrepreneurship and uh, investing in other women. And I'm wondering if, you see something parallel happening uh, on the political front as women become more involved in um, starting companies or investing in other women's companies. Are we seeing the same thing happen politically? Are women becoming more politically active in terms of donating to women candidates? Um, and if not, should that be a part of our discussion? Dina Powell. Well, I think um, you're right to say, gosh, we're, we're starting to hear these themes. Women are a good investment, supporting uh, women, you know, yields to economic growth. But that only really has happened in recent years, and it was when data emerged, um, data that the IDB um, had in the global context, data that we um, had our, our economists wrote, Womenomics and Women Hold Up Half the Sky, that actually showed that when women are a greater part of the labor force in emerging economies, global GDP grows. And so while there's been, you know, many years of people 
people advocating for women in different sectors until you have data that it shows it really makes a difference and it's not the right thing to do. It's the, actually, it's just smart economics. Um, I think that's when you started to feel that the, the debate was really changing and everybody was almost just saying, well, of course that makes sense. Of course half of society participating uh, leads to pr more productive growth. Um, and I think that's what's got to happen here, too. You know, when we begin to actually show data that it really makes a difference when you have a woman in the room, when cons it consensus uh, builds more quickly. Um, you know, even in the context of 10,000 women, it really, now in our fifth year, we're realizing that many of the women start off as a tiny entrepreneur, uh, maybe in Lagos, Nigeria, or Kigali, Rwanda, or Cairo, Egypt, and the, obviously through the business training, they grow their business, they emerge as a business leader, but the biggest takeaway for them is confidence, and suddenly they're becoming political leaders now. Karen Mills, 10 seconds. So in America, no pressure. we want to create jobs. And what I saw traveling all around this country is mayors and community developers. Uh, more and more of them are women. And they are integrating all of the activity on that regional level. It turns out that's the key to creating these entrepreneurial ecosystems, which create vibrant communities out of Pittsburgh and Minnesota. And I think women are emerging politically because they're driving economic growth at this area. Then they run for mayor. That's then right. they can be governor. So we are seeing um, a really good confluence of things. Women involved in communities and economic growth, creating a lot of jobs, getting political credibility, coming to the next level, bringing with them those economic strategies. I'm very hopeful for those pieces. And so one quick statistic from Emily's list. Uh, apparently, it takes up to six times to ask for a woman to run for office before she will consider it versus like not asking at all for guys. And <laughs> I wanted to make the connection on how in terms of, uh, I, I don't have enough fingers in my hands to tell you how many guys I know who are like, I'm an angel investor. I put 2K down in my body startup. And there was a woman who heard me speak at a conference. She made a beeline for me and she was like, I need to go through your boot camp. And it turned out that she had invested $75,000 in a company the year before and she didn't consider herself an angel investor so a lot of it is owning it and the fact is that it, funding is not meritocratic. We talked about boards and someone, of course, I got into the Twitter fray and my whole take was if actually it were meritocratic, there would be more boards with women and people of color. And I'll leave you with one um, resource suggestion, which is Nilla for Merchant. She wrote a very interesting op-ed on the whole Twitter fiasco in, on time and she can be found in, uh, on Twitter at, at Nilla as we say goodbye, I wanted to note that Beth Brook of EY, who was going to be with us, was attending to urgent personal matters. She sent me a note. Uh, she said that uh, she sends her best and says the women rule. Uh, I want to thank all of you out in live stream land. Thank you for the Twitter Can we question. We thank our designated dude. Also? Yeah. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much. So it's for this diversity. Was, this was a treat. Uh, thank you in the audience. Uh, we thank Google and the Tory Burch Foundation for making this amazing. Uh, program possible. Uh, our political colleagues, the events team of Beth Lester Sidhu, Lois Romano, everybody who works so hard on it, and we thank our panelists for a great conversation. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Politico's events editor, Lois Romano. Um, it's my honor to introduce to you the next panel, if everybody will bring it down a little bit. Um, who, which includes three very inspirational women. Um, moderating will be PBS's newly minted um, anchor, co-anchor, Judy Woodruff, who has blazed a trail for women in broadcast journalism and is always available to lend a helping hand to other women, as she is doing today. Um, she will be talking to Tori Birch, um, one of our partners today, which we're very excited about, the CEO, fashion designer, and philanthropist. Um, you all know Tori Birch's designs, and you've all worn them. But what you might not know is that Tori is using her platform to develop the Tori Birch Foundation, which basically is helping women um, build sustainable businesses through mentoring, through helping with financing. Um, and she has a wonderful story to tell. And also joining them is Milan Verveer, who is now with um, the Georgetown Center of Women, Peace, and Security. She was the first women's global ambassador um, at the State Department. And as many of you in this room know who know Milan, um, she has always been willing to help other women and has helped a lot of us. So please welcome them.
thank you, Lois. Uh, all three of us are delighted to be here. Uh, it sounds like you've already, we know you've already had a terrific conversation uh, in the first panel. It's gotten everybody thinking and, and uh, uh, stewing about what women can do, how much difference women can make. And these two women are, we are so fortunate to be able to hear from the two of them, given their backgrounds, given what they have done. Uh, so I just am privileged to be here to, to be able to talk to you, Tori and Milan. So let's get right to it. Um, I want to ask each of you from, from your own perspective, and Tori, I'll start with you. Why is it important? Why does it matter whether women get involved as entrepreneurs, whether women, I mean, even setting the word entrepreneur aside, why does it matter that women are engaged in the economy? It's funny. Well, th first of all, thank you. For, I'm so thrilled to be here. But uh, when I was growing up, I had three brothers, and I never knew that women faced challenges because I was raised to think about my brothers and I were the same. We would always want to do and have similar dreams and that I wouldn't have more obstacles than they would just based on my gender. And then I went to Penn. I graduated from Penn. I went, got into the workforce. And um, fast forward maybe 15 years, I tried to start my own business. And that's when I really saw the challenges kick in and saw how challenging it was for me. And I had been lucky enough to have certain things that I had access to people and I had enough money to start a business uh, carefully. But I saw that there were a lot of biased people out there. And it was very difficult for me to raise money uh, in the beginning as well. So even though uh, you did have some resources, you did it, you see, as you were saying, you had some support systems, it was still hard? It was very hard. And we didn't have a lot of resources or we had a lot of support. And that's one thing I realized is through my career, mentorship was such a big part of it. And I, whether it was different roles I had in business, but when I started my company, I was an information gatherer. So I went back to all the people I had worked with and got their advice and really leaned on it and then made my own decisions. Well, I want to, and I want to come back to several of the things you said, but Milan, from your perspective, why does it matter that women are involved in the economy? You've, I mean, we know you, you have been uh, in all the important jobs in Washington, wow. uh, chief of staff Hardly. to the first lady, assistant to the president, you, the woman who, the person who started Vital Voices, uh, the important role you've played at the State Department, and now you've started this whole new school at Georgetown. Well, I think, Judy, we know, um, like no other time, uh, because we are functioning from an evidence-based um, body, a building block, we know that women drive uh, economic growth. They are critical to jobs creation. Now, we know that from myriad sources, we have a growing uh, body of research and data that says that to us and I think speaks loudly to the, not just the governmental sector today, but to the business community that if you do want to create jobs and you do want to create growth, which everybody wants to see, whether in our personal lives, uh, in terms of our own uh, incomes, or in terms of the betterment of the larger economy on which we all depend, whether we're a business or uh, we're trying to grow those economies, that women matter, and women matter in very significant ways. Let me just give you a very quick snapshot. For example, the World Economic Forum, which is you know, the bastion of uh, global economic leaders puts out an annual gender gap report. And it may sound like an oxymoron. Why do they put out a gender gap report? Well, they do it because as they look at countries and the gap between men and women in a country on several metrics, including economic participation, the countries where that gap is closer to being closed, guess what? They're more economically competitive and more prosperous. We know that women-owned businesses are accelerators uh, of GDP. As one CEO said, the smallest, the lowest hanging fruit to pick in some ways, because it's, if you really do want to do this, you really have to invest uh, in women entrepreneurs. Uh, and Karen said on the earlier panel what a difference women entrepreneurs have made in our own economy. Uh, and economists show that in the years to come, they will be responsible for about a third of the jobs in the United States. So that's not insignificant. We know women invest their money differently. They invest it and plow it back into their families, their communities. It raises the standard of living. And if you're a business today, probably one of the biggest reasons it matters is because women are the consumers. Uh, they have the purchasing power 
to the trillions and trillions of dollars, which will account for uh, three-fifths of purchasing power in the next couple of years. So for so many reasons, no matter where you sit, if the economy matters, then women matter. There is just no way to escape it. But if that's the case, Tori, then why has it been so hard, do you think, for women to get in and to be where they want to be and where they should be? Well, I, one of the biggest challenges I face and every woman faces is when you become a mother and, and the work-life balance. And that's something that, when I started the company, was really part of our business plan as well, is how do we create a place where we all want to work, where it's about kindness and creativity, but really it's also about how do women be great moms and great leaders? And, and how do we wor worry about the quality of the work, not the quantity? And that's, that's really what the kind of company we have. I think out of 2,400 employees, is 80% women. And, and, and as you've, that's amazing. <laughs> but as you've, as you've tried to build it, I mean, I want to I wanna get you to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the obstacles you ran into in the early days. You said it, you know, decisions were made, there is some bias. There is a lot of bias. I, I guess one of the obstacles is when I went to actually raise the money. And, and um, I'm not sure if you knew this, and we don't talk about it a lot, but part of the business plan when I started the company was that we wanted to start a foundation. And when I said that to people when I went to raise money, particularly men, they said, don't ever use that business and social responsibility in the same sentence. And I thought that was so interesting because Number one, we wanted to ne always use it, and that was going to be part of who we were and what we wanted to stand for. And so that was one obstacle. I think also just um, women think differently. And I think men often, and I, I'm not so pro-women, pro-men. It's not right. really about that for me. But I think that I think there's a different way of management skills. There's ways of looking at business. Um, for me, I learned on the job, so I had that. On, on top of everything else. I didn't have the experience. I didn't have the business experience or the design experience. So there were a lot of obstacles. And I think it was a, a bit of blind faith. And people um, just, I, I didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to, it to speak for itself. Milan, what are some examples of, of how you've seen women deal with these kinds of obstacles that Tori is describing, both at, from a government perspective and in the private sector. Well, it is true that uh, one of the reasons we haven't been able to unlock this vital force uh, in ways that would have the kind of impact it should have and has been having but could be so much greater uh, is because of these obstacles. Uh, ob obstacles that you heard from on the earlier panel. Women need kinds of training, uh, business training, they can't always get. Mentors, absolutely. Um, networks, to be part of networks where you know uh, where the know-how is and who can help you to the next stage. Uh, network sounds like such a simple phrase, but it is, it is really filled with all kinds of uh, opportunity. Access to capital is probably the biggest problem. Uh, and creating financial tools that enable women, whether uh, angel funds, which they rarely benefit from, other kinds of venture capital, but particularly loan guarantees, the kinds of things Karen did at the SBA and our, our government has promoted in this country, they are critically important because women need to be able to access the capital. And it's almost like there's a, a conversation that it runs on parallel tracks instead of intersecting between a businesswoman and a, a, a bank administrator, they talk past each other or don't really understand each other. And I remember years ago, I was with uh, then First Lady Hillary Clinton and we were with a group of uh, Hispanic entrepreneurs and one of them said to her something I've never forgotten. They had been struggling, she and her colleagues had been struggling to set up a computer business. And she said, you know, Mrs. Clinton, the best ideas die in bank parking lots. And it is so true in so many ways. And add to this markets, women need to grow their markets. So one of the big solutions today has been what businesses are doing to use their supply chain to buy from women entrepreneurs, from women-owned businesses. So you're, you're talking about it takes deliberate uh, action ahead of time, anticipating the problem. Is it getting better, Tori? 
I think it is getting better. And it's interesting, access to capital is certainly part of the problem, but also what we've done with Goldman Sachs, 10,000 small businesses, I think, has been extraordinary to see women having access to business classes. And that's something that they haven't had the opportunity to have. So for us to be able to, with Dina's help and, and guidance, really offer that to women has been extraordinary for our, our entrepreneurs. Is there enough of that going on? That's, that's been a fantastic example, what Goldman Sachs is doing. Are there are there other organizations trying to do that in other parts of the country? Judy, this is what's changed dramatically. And I think it's the great news story. I think it's why so many of you are here. It's why we've got this topic. And it's the recognition today, there's a paradigm shift. We're all in this together. Government has a role. Businesses have a role. You know, despite what that businessman or several, banker several. said to you <laughs> about social responsibility, I think what's happening in the business community today is Business looks at its brand. You know, CSR and contributions are over here. But today, their investment in women's economic participation is part of the brand. Uh, and so you see major companies, in addition to Goldman Sachs, Walmart, Coca-Cola, major, major initiatives, ExxonMobil, uh, whether in training, whether in sourcing uh, from women-owned businesses, uh, whether in uh, providing special access to credit actually, working the situation in a way where a purchasing order. If I'm Walmart and I'm gonna purchase a lot from this woman-owned business, she doesn't have collateral, she can't get the loan to actually deliver the kind of uh, uh, prod product in the, in the magnitude that she needs to for this order, that will count for her. So there's a lot of creativity going on, and I think the good news story is that we're increasingly recognizing that we're all in this together, uh, and business is a huge partner. And in a minute, I want to take, offer you all the chance to ask some questions. But Tori, that brings up to me the, the, this, this notion of how do young women, or for that matter, women of any age who are interested in doing something in the business world as entrepreneurs, how do they know how to get started? I mean, is there enough information out there for them to know, here's how I get a mentor, here's how I get the training that I need? I mean, I think that is one of the problems, is just they don't realize how much there is to help them when they get started. And that's something our, our foundation is really focusing on as well. Is, and also the idea of peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, because regardless of the business, many of the, the startups are experiencing many of the same problems. And so they could really help each other and form a network uh, and also use each other's products and that's something that Milan referenced but I think if we can figure out a way and maybe that's something maybe online mentoring which is something that we're going to be interested in to show them all of um, everything that's out there to help them whether it's get access to loans whether it's mentoring whether it's education I think that would be really helpful I think many of the entrepreneurs I meet don't don't know what's out there. How do you identify? How do you connect with the women you, you try to support through your foundation? Well, we meet them. Terry McCullough is our executive director. We get emails daily now, many, many, through um, other, with Axion as one of our partners. We, we meet and vet many, many entrepreneurs. And it's sort of how do we look at the business as viable? How do we, is it the right business to stand behind? But we're meeting them in so many different ways. It can be a friend of a friend. It can be a mother. It's all ages by the way. But, but Milan, there still are, I think, many women out there, I'm sure internationally, but in this country, who feel they're alone in this. Well, they do indeed, Judy, and I think it's particularly true uh, in the developing world, and that was one of the reasons uh, that this issue, 21st century statecraft, if you will, became such a dominant issue over the last four years, to really focus on helping countries, but at the same time, in order to do that, to really help the women who had the possibilities to grow those economies. So whether it was in Africa, helping women take advantage of trade agreements, right. which they'd never taken advantage of throughout South America, working with partners like IDB, and Julie was just here on the first panel, or working with uh, other uh, businesses who wanted to be a part of this. And I look at this, this, this wonderful audience and I think of so many women here who have so much also to give as mentors. Mm. And as someone said earlier, it's a two-way street. I have never met a mentor who didn't feel that she wasn't the beneficiary. The mentees always tell you they learn so much and they want to pay it forward. 
the mentor also will tell you the same thing. And most of these programs have hinged rather significantly on the goodwill of so many professional women and women who have some skill set to provide uh, to help others, whether it's in this country or overseas, and those are extraordinary experiences. You mean women who've already who've already made women it? Women who so are to speak. in in the in the business or helping those who are coming up. So it's a two-way street. How do you change the minds, Tori? I mean, you mentioned one of the conversations you had early on. How do you change the minds of people like that? What do you have uh, to do? People like the the gentleman you said who well, said, I mean, you know, I "Don't ever let's say." I assume it was a man who told you that. Was, don't ever talk about it. It was more than one, but uh, <laughs> let's let's start with my three boys. So I'm getting them early, and I think that listen, I think it's by. Um, by, by doing something. And, and you know, I, it's not that I ever want to be preachy or my team, but I think that mm -hmm. we want to be examples. And we want to show them people that have that mindset that there's different ways of thinking. And, um, and it's actually beneficial for the economy. It's beneficial for us all to come together. And I have had the experience where I have been mentored, but I, I have had the experience where women have helped me a lot. And that's something that's very interesting. I think that um, women help other women. And that's, that's something that is, is all of our experience in this room, probably. I think one of the, uh, at least what, what we have found, is that one of the most significant ways to persuade is by explaining how this is in the other party's self-interest. And that's where evidence has made such a big difference. Because how do you argue with data? and data that is growing uh, in significant amounts. And I could go and say, well, this is the right thing to do. She deserves a helping hand. Who knows? She may create a phenomenal business. Uh, and somebody else will say, well, that's nice. It's not so serious. Not really what I should be involved in. Then show them the data about how this investment could pay off. And that changes everything, because it's no longer about her, which it is, the right thing to do it all of a sudden is the smart strategic thing to do. And so you're shifting why this is in the interest, whether it's of the banker or the government leader uh, or any number of actors who are part of this uh, chain that is so critical to the women-owned uh, uh, business or female entrepreneur. And what do you say, I mean, I'm coming, I'm coming at it from the devil's advocate position, what do you say to those who, and particularly men, who say, well, women just don't, Many women, most women, don't have the drive that men do. They're not ready to just set everything aside and focus on success. Uh, yeah. it, it, what, what's the what's an answer to that? I would say there's it's not even worth responding to when people say that, <laughs> and right. and really that's sort of how I look at it. I I've heard a lot of comments like that, and and when you look at our company and and the growth that we've had in nine years. Um, that pretty sets that sets that conversation up for a different. But you've heard that or a uh, version of that. I've heard it a lot. Right. I've heard it a lot. And and the, you know you talked about women as as mothers and the, uh, women do have to carve out different career paths and do diff things differently at different stages of their lives. Oh, yeah. And I d sorry, no, no, but I, I did actually, and that was hard because when I had my third son, I was at a job at LVMH, and I realized I could not keep the pace up. So I decided to take four years off and be a mom. And it was during those four years that I came up with the concept of our company. But it was—it's very difficult. It's the challenge that we all have to figure out how to work with. But I would say to those people who say women don't have drive, uh, that they should look at the reality today. Uh, because even if you, if you look at the United States and the fact, as Karen said, uh, women-owned businesses are outpacing um, male-owned businesses in terms of creation uh, and in terms of, of yield. Uh, so this is the one that really I always think about because if you look at women's economic participation just in the last decade in the developed world, forget about the developing world, what women have produced in terms of helping the economies amounts to outpacing what China has contributed to the economy. Wow. We are talking wow. about a lot of power. Uh, and imagine how much more could be unleashed, how our world could change, how our own country could benefit uh, if this vital force were uh, unleashed because you helped women overcome the obstacles that they confront, whether it's in the balancing or it's in the access to finance, 
but enabled women to unleash that potential, uh, there's no telling w what we could do for ourselves as well as uh, as for our countries and our economies. All right, th we've gotten this off to such a great start. Questions out here for these two uh, incredibly inspiring women? I see a hand behind you. Um, we have oh, well, go ahead. Kathleen yeah. Matthews, Executive Vice President of Marriott, has a question. Hi, thank you so much. This has been great, the first panel and uh, your panel now. Um, I just wanted to build on Milan's comments about the role of big business in this proposition. And how many people in the room are with a corporation or represent uh, associations with big industries? Um, because I think there's a real big role for us to play. And you suggested this, Milan, that through our supply chain, we can really do a lot. And I think what I'm finding at a, a company like Marriott, which has supported women-owned businesses in our supply chain for decades here in the US, we're now trying to extend that into the new markets around the world where we're opening up hotels. Um, uh, what we've realized is that in the past, we saw that as part of our social responsibility as a company. We saw it as the, the good way to do business. But now we are seeing the brand building for it. So for example, when we open up a new hotel in Dubai, as we did earlier this year, one of the business strategies was to invite the local women's business networks into the hotel for a luncheon very much like this, and to say, we want this to be your favorite hotel in town. How are we gonna do that? We want you to sell us your goods. So who here makes uniforms? Who here makes chef's hats? Who here produces lettuce? Who here produces eggs? If you have those products, we can buy them and we can start a business relationship. So for that brand, the JW Marriott brand, we saw the opportunity to meet our supply chain needs, but to also invite those women in as customers and as partners, knowing that ultimately that's one of the best strategies we could have for making that a successful hotel. So looking for those creative ways where you go from social responsibility or CSR to contributions, to really embedding this as a strategy in your business, becomes really, I think, the win-win. Milan, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of the commitment that's been made recently on this? Because Marriott is one of many companies joining on a commitment to try to uh, actually um, procure $1.5 billion uh, worth of goods and services from women around the world. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, Kathleen, first let me salute you and Marriott because she has done an extraordinary job in looking at her company and its purchasing power through its own supply chain, whether it's soap in the hotel rooms, or as she said, the uniforms for the, uh, the, the people who uh, do a lot of the work in the, in the systems. And what this has done, it's not only made a difference for the local economy, for a hotel chain like Marriott to purchase locally, it has provided all kinds of opportunities for those women-owned businesses to grow their businesses because all of a sudden they've got customers they never dreamed of having, uh, often at a scale they could only have dreamt about uh, in ways that never seemed real. But they're contributing to the vitality of the local economy, which is going to provide more discretionary income for people to go to the hotel among other businesses uh, in, in whatever city they're in. Uh, and what Kathleen was referring to that uh, at CGI, the Clinton Global Initiative, a couple of weeks ago, a large group of companies, NGOs, uh, and other actors came together uh, and made a commitment uh, that each of them in their way would contribute to this purchasing clout through their own supply chains or through their training programs. Uh, or other significant ways in enabling women to benefit, uh, that is going to amount to, if it succeeds, bringing in a billion plus uh, in new uh, revenues, uh, potential income to uh, women-owned businesses. It's, it's phenomenal in terms of what it represents, but I think it's really phenomenal to see this kind of collaborative, which I think is another way the paradigm right. has shifted that it's now NGOs working side by side with governments, working side by side with businesses to unleash what is in everybody's interest, how many, and particularly women. Excuse me, how many big corporations do you think recognize that they have that special responsibility? Uh, well, I want to ask both of you, you know, from that your observation. That sounds very unique, what Marriott's doing, but I know a lot yeah. of big corporations well, do have. Well, look what Tory's doing. 
I mean, she's doing it a different way. She's doing it through really addressing access to capital in many ways, and particularly the needs, the knowledge needs, the experiential needs that women have in, in getting their businesses off. If I can say this, several years ago, she and I talked, and she was just creating her foundation, just trying to think through what, where could she make her most significant contribution. And she focused on her own experience, the kind of business she has, and she really wanted to help other entrepreneurs and focused on the United States uh, in her situation. And look what she's blossomed today, developing a partnership with 10,000 women and so many others. So I think this is the kind of creativity that's going on. And it's really, it's really taking off in ways that I think is going to uh, make such a difference economically for everybody. But what, one thing I just wanted to add to that, thank you, Mom. But one thing I wanted to add to that is that it, in the beginning, when we were thinking about the foundation, we wanted to have impact. But then what we've realized is because of the foundation, it's affecting the bottom line. And it's really amazing for our business. It's attracting incredible talent that want to work at our company. Our consumer is loving the fact that we have this. It's not something that I knew going into it, but it's been a win-win. And that is a point that I think is, is really worth accentuating. Business doesn't do this for charitable purposes. Business does it rightly because it's good for business. Uh, it's about the bottom line, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's why businesses are in business. But it now, we know it has a so social value attached to it. So you get a win-win. You get the bottom line win, and you get the win for society and larger wins in this conversation for women. Another question. Who's out there? Oh, right here. Yeah. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Amanda Riggs. I just started an organic skincare company called Verita, where I source from women owned What's businesses. The name of it again? Verita, it means okay. a, uh, truth in Italian. Okay. Um, so I source from uh, women businesses in the Middle East and produce all by women's cooperatives. And I'm now wondering, uh, this question is for Tori, how, how you grew from a small business to a medium business? Because I have two other uh, women businesses in Egypt that want me to be, um, that want me, uh, that want to uh, provide for me. And I'm wondering, you know, how do I grow? How can I incorporate them into my supply chain? Um, so it's more of a technical question. Thank well, you. Well, it's, it's um, hard to just narrow it down, but I would say um, networking is key and, and taking advantage of different connections you know and, 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 and doing that, but um, social media, I would say, is how we really built our business because we did not have a budget for advertising. We had to really think creatively. And we launched e-commerce nine years ago, which was unusual. It was sort of new territory back then to sell online. But then as each new platform became available, we started to really be interested in looking at that platform about how it could help us build our business and how it could help gain brand recognition, whether it was Facebook, Pinterest. All, there's so many different ones. I personally do Instagram and Twitter. But then our company does Facebook and everything else, Senior Weibo. But it's, crucial as you go forward, I would say. I'd say that is a, a great way that's cost effective to build your business. Which means you need to bring people on board who uh, yeah, I follow would say all definitely that, people, get it. But we don't have an enormous team and, we, and, and I would say it's a younger person because... That's <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Tori, tell them how many uh, stores you have outside of the United States now. So we, we have 103 stores globally and about 43 outside of wow. the states. That is it's terrific. remarkable. It's fabulous. Thank you. It's terrific. Okay, another question. Here's your chance. One back here. Hi, my name is Meg Byram. I'm a blogger and a small business entrepreneur. Um, my question is more, I, it's for all of you and for all of us here to think about. It's kind of more about the women movement in general. And I saw the Makers movie. That was the three long hour movie. And on it, something Gloria Steinem said really stuck with me. And it was that by defining our movement and using the word women entrepreneurs and women this and women that, we almost um, separate ourselves even more. And so I'm curious to know your opinion and maybe how should we phrase our movement together so that it's not just women entrepreneurs. We're just entrepreneurs. We're just business people. And so we're not 
further defined by our sex or um, our race or whatever it is. And so I'm, you know, that's something that I've been really thinking about. And um, you know, we define it a lot as women, but because that's what we are, and we should stick together. And I'm obviously a big proponent of helping other women, but is that helping us integrate into the male kind of dominated fields? It's a great question. Uh, the Makers, the documentary on PBS, by the way, if I could pat PBS on the back <laughs> a little bit. So, uh, so what, what about that? That's a good well, question. It is uh, an excellent question. And when I became ambassador for global women's issues, you could have said the same thing. Why do we need an ambassador for women? And I always said I would rue for the day when you wouldn't need an office like that or somebody focused on these issues because we would be truly integrated. And the mission of the office was really not to create separate programs for women so much as to integrate these issues across the department. Department has a lot of power. Government has a lot of power. They work on all regions of the world. They work on economic issues. They work on human rights issues. The key was to make sure that within the operations of all of those other functions of the State Department, that women's considerations and perspectives would enable more effective outcomes in those programs. Now, we're not there yet. We have particular obstacles. We've got to keep moving this engine down the, the tracks. But I often have felt, just as your question represented, that as soon as I said women's issues, marginalization popped up, <laughs> even though we're talking about half the population of the world. Uh, so I, I do think, one, we have to recognize that we can't look at women's issues as solely women's issues. If women succeed, everybody succeeds. If women are prosperous, the world is more prosperous. These issues are about men and women, about boys and girls. But as soon as you say women's issues, they're only about women. So we have to talk about impacts, evidence, high yield dividends. Uh, it's a long road, but ultimately I hope we get where you are, where your question was. No, and I, I also obviously agree with Milan, but uh, it's, it's a fine line and you have to be careful. I remember I was at an event and I was introduced as a female CEO. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got up and started laughing and I said, you know, I've never heard a male introduced as a male CEO before. And so it really struck a chord. But I think it does, you have to be careful. In my opinion, that it's not just a women's issue because it's, to me, about the quality of work. It's about ambition. It's about impact. And, and those are the important conversations. And, and as Milan said, if a woman is successful, the family is often successful, the communities are often successful, so it's affecting everyone. I think we would all agree we'd love to get to the day where we didn't need to have these conversations, right. where it was just automatic, that it was easy for women to get the funding that they need, to be accepted, to be able to go and do and create and build, as uh, the two of you have done. So uh, with that, I just want to say it's been a privilege for me to be here. Thank you very much. The clock has run out up here. Uh, I am told that uh, you all are welcome to stay to continue your conversation. But on behalf of Politico and all the other sponsors, including the Tory Burch uh, Foundation, let's thank our panelists, Tory and Milan. And Thanks to, to all of you, to the table leaders, to everyone who came. I've been given uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, response, the assignment of saying thank you to everyone because there were so many people who came together to make today possible. Thank you for being here. Hang around a little longer if you'd like to. Thanks. Yeah,